Uh, so my name is Marcel, and on behalf of my co-author Tom Schultz and myself, I'm going to be telling you today about how in-group bias copying promotes cultural diversity and cultural complexity. Okay, so first let's start with some definitions. Uh, by culture, you can very broadly refer to basically any non-genetically transmitted information. In practice, we often want to characterize this as being broken down into distinct cultural traits. So for example, behaviors, concepts, material products, things like that. And these are spread typically through social learning, or you might hear me use the term copying or cultural transmission as well. Okay, so the process by which these traits are generated is called innovation. You can innovate a trait kind of out of whole cloth. Uh, you can refine an existing trait. Or what's going to be particularly interesting in our case is that you can recombine multiple traits into one more complex and probably more efficient trait. So let me give you an example of that. Uh, many thousands of years ago, somebody invented the scissors. Uh, it wasn't until several thousand years later that somebody invented the pivot. But when you combine these two, you got what we all understand as modern scissors today, which is the pivoted scissors. So this is an example where two independent traits were combined into a more complex and efficient one. So what makes recombination interesting is that it's thought to be particularly common and particularly important in humans as a form of innovation. And also, I want you to notice that it's uh, a form of innovation that's actually contingent on cultural diversity. Because in order to be able to recombine multiple traits, you need multiple traits. OK, so one feature of human culture that's particularly notable is that it is very cumulative. So we not only preserve information through social learning, we also build upon it over many generations as well. And so for, to give you a very uh, basic example, Isaac Newton did not come up with classical mechanics on his own. And as he put it, if I have seen further than others, it is only by standing on the shoulders of giants. And you can see this cultural accumulation in humans in a variety of measures. You can see it in the amount of cultural traits. You can see it in the efficiency of cultural traits. And you can see it in the complexity of cultural traits. And what this process ultimately results in is sophisticated technologies, forms of social organization, and understandings, for example, scientific theories that far exceed what any single generation of individuals could produce on their own. OK, so one thing that I want to call your attention to here is that whereas cultural transmission is something that happens at the individual and group level and over short time scales, cultural evolution is something that happens at the population level over long time scales. And so this has implications for how we study each of these phenomena. So in the case of cultural transmission, it's rather easy to do experiments around this, whereas if we want to reason about something like cumulative cultural evolution, we often have to turn to other methods, uh, and namely theoretical modeling. OK, so let me give you an example of that. Uh, there's been several psychological studies suggesting that if you break people down into uh, groups, and then you put them into a task where solutions can, can be recombined. So you can have you know, some basic level solution, another basic level solution. And if you combine those, you get some more efficient and complex solution. When the task is structured that way, and you break people down to the groups, uh, what's been observed is that when groups are partially connected, they tend to outperform the groups that are fully connected. The reasoning behind this is that when groups are fully connected, they tend to focus in rather quickly on a single solution. Whereas when groups are fragmented, they tend to develop multiple solutions independently, which are then later recombined into a more complex solution. <coughs> and so the question here is, if we take this individual or group level phenomenon, does it scale to the population level over long time scales? And here's what the models, previous models have shown about this. If a population is strongly connected, innovation spread quickly and culture homogenizes. And the consequence of that is that uh, behavioral alternatives or cultural traits tend to go unexplored. So here you can imagine that this network is a population that's learning how to fish. One individual in this network discovers the fishing spear. That quickly spreads through the population, and this discourages the population from inventing any alternative ways of solving the problem. Uh, conversely, if a population is very weakly connected, it can be difficult to reliably preserve traits. So here, for example, an individual in the, in the blue subgroup invents a fishing rod, but you know they're unlucky. 
Uh, they die and get replaced before this information can spread because the network is very sparsely connected. And sometime later, somebody in the orange group invents a fishing spear. This time they're a little luckier, they stick around longer, transmission is able to occur, and this spreads throughout the population. Now, you have this Goldilocks zone where the uh, population is intermediately connected. And what happens here is that these multiple traditions are able to flourish before homogenization takes place. So this results in more cultural traits, more opportunities for recombination, and therefore greater cultural complexity. So here you can see that an individual in the, in the blue group, once again, invents a fishing rod. This spreads throughout the blue group, but not to the red group yet. And so somebody in the red group invents the fishing spear. This spreads through the red group, but not yet to the blue group. Eventually they exchange these ideas and both groups end up with a more diverse and ultimately complex culture if they're able to recombine these down the line in some way. <coughs> All right, so uh, I've spoken a little bit about how population connectedness affects cumulative cultural evolution, uh, but what else could slow homogenization? Well, one good candidate here is copying biases or biases in cultural transmission. Uh, so we had a series of experiments that we published earlier this year where we were looking at what happens when you break people down into completely arbitrary minimal groups. Does this affect who they're likely to copy or not? So these groups were completely arbitrary. They were fully intermixed, so there's absolutely no uh, social network structure. And there is, importantly, no competition between these groups. We never tell them how their group is scoring, how the opposite group is scoring, anything like that. All performance is measured purely individually. And what we observe is that people do indeed significantly prefer to copy members of their own group, despite this group being completely arbitrary. And in fact, they still prefer to copy their own group, even when they rate their own group as being less competent than the other group. Now, what's more immediately relevant here is that uh, another thing that we observed is that these groups actually diverge culturally. So the pattern of responses that people offered tended to be more similar to their own group than they were to the opposite group. And so the question that this raises is, again, if we bring this into the context of large populations and long time scales, would an in-group copying bias serve as a mechanism for producing cultural diversity? Okay, so to answer this question, we built an agent-based model. Uh, and this model goes through roughly four stages. In the first stage, each individual has some low probability of innovating. So if it has no uh, traits in its repertoire, it invents a new trait, uh, again, out of thin air. If it already has some trait in its cultural repertoire, it tries to invent a more sophisticated version of that trait. Because we assume that this process is occasionally at least dependent on recombination, there are some restrictions within the model. So uh, to create a trait of high complexity, you have to have a sufficiently large uh, cultural repertoire. And again, this is coming back to what I said earlier. In order to be able to recombine traits, you need traits to recombine. Okay, so in the next stage, individuals observe some random neighbor of theirs. They look at what trait is currently exhibiting. And then with some low probability, they are able to copy it. So if this trait is of a type that's completely unfamiliar to the individual, they're just going to adopt a very simple version of that trait. If it's of a, tr of a type that is familiar to the individual, but more complex than the one that they already have, they adopt an incrementally more complex version of it. Uh, next, what happens is that every individual selects a behavior from their repertoire to exhibit. This is just the most complex behavior that they have. And then finally, they're subject to some sort of replacement. So with some probability, you die and you get replaced by a new naive agent with an empty, uh, with an empty cultural repertoire. This process then repeats and it cycles for quite a while. And then we look at what happens to complexity and particularly steady state complexity uh, over time. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna look at here is what happens when your population is fully connected. So you can say that there's basically no, uh, there's no social network structure because everybody's equally likely to interact with everybody else. And what you can see here in the plot on the right is cultural complexity over time. And what the different color lines represent is how likely are you to deliberately seek out an in-group member rather than copying simply uniformly at random. 
And so what you can see is that strong biases such as the orange line and the green line tend to produce higher levels of cultural complexity than purely unbiased copying. And that's despite, again, there being absolutely no social network structure here because everybody's fully connected. Okay, the second thing that I'm gonna talk to you about here is uh, here on the right, what we're plotting is the steady state level of cultural complexity. So this is no longer a plot over time. Uh, what's varying on the x-axis is the strength of the in-group copying bias. And in the colored lines, what we're varying is the reliability of social learning. And so what you see here, for example, in the purple line, is that as soon as social learning reaches some level of reliability, strong biases towards copying in-group members tend to maximize cultural complexity. Now, when, uh, when copying becomes more reliable, notice that this population is more susceptible to cultural homogenization. You can see that its base level of cultural complexity is actually lower there on the left. But the flip side of that is that such populations actually benefit more from strong in-group copying biases. It tends to produce even higher levels of cultural complexity. And then finally, in the red, what you see here is when copying becomes too, too unreliable to actually prevent uh, culture from being lost. So what's happening is as the in-group copying bias gets stronger, this actually impedes cultural diffusion. And so traits end up being lost because they're no longer being spread freely enough to be preserved by the population. All right, finally, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about what happens when you actually fragment this population. So you introduce some sort of social network structure here where the probability of in-group uh, copying it, or in-group connections is higher than the probability of intergroup connections. And so here G, which you'll see in the colors, is measuring the number of groups. So that's basically a proxy for the level of fragmentation in the population. Uh, and again, the x-axis is the strength of the in-group copying bias, and we're just looking at cultural complexity at steady state. Okay, so the first thing to notice is that intermediate levels of population fragmentation tend to produce higher levels of cultural complexity than either low or high levels of population fragmentation. This is just reproducing the population structure effects that we talked about earlier. But what you'll notice here over on the right side of the graph is that the in-group copying bias actually interacts quite strongly with population, uh, as soon as the population is fragmented into groups, right? So the social network structure uh, actually interacts with the copying bias. Okay, so to summarize our findings, uh, much like population connectedness, we find that yes, in-group bias copying does promote cultural diversity and cultural complexity when it's generalized to large populations over long time scales. Uh, we find that the, uh, the extent to which the in-group copying bias influences cultural complexity scales with the reliably copying. So one consequence of this is that if you have populations with mechanisms for stabilizing cultural transmission, so for example, writing, institutionalized pedagogy, or techniques for preserving oral traditions, you would ex expect such populations, which are typically more vulnerable to cultural homogenization, to benefit more from an in-group copying bias for pr uh, promoting and generating cultural diversity in this cultural complexity. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this in-group copying bias interacts with population connectedness. So it's not the case that you can simply look at each of these independently. You have to consider them both in the context of the other. All right, thank you.